Hey, welcome back to E Crime Bites. This is season two, episode 10, act three of Dutch and Razzlecon. Dutch is a Bitfinex hacker. Razzlecon is a rapper turned money launderer. They're married. And they stole, at the time, it was $71 million. That appreciated to 2022 of about $5 billion. So they're sitting on a ton of money. And we last left you with them trying to launder it in any way possible, either using, you know, cop like fake accounts that they buy online to Razzlecon's legitimate businesses. They were stuffing cryptocurrency everywhere to try to make it look legit so that they can buy the stuff that you're going to see in this act, which is a lot of fun. So November 2021, Dutch and Razzlecon inadvertently find out they're being investigated. And I say inadvertently because typically in the investigation process, what happens is law enforcement will issue or they'll do their court process and subpoenas and so forth behind the scenes. And the defendant won't know that they're being investigated and they will go to places like Google and say, I want this person's email. They'll go to your cell phone place and they'll say, I want all his cell phone transactions and his text messages and all that stuff. And they go to all these different spots where you'll have data and they do it in a manner that you won't know. So you won't be, you won't, your suspicion won't be alerted and you won't go out there and delete a bunch of evidence. Okay. So obviously the company that they're getting data from no. And in this case, that company that law enforcement was getting data from inadvertently notified Dutch and Razzlecon before they were supposed to know. So they knew that they were under investigation. So immediately, you know, Dutch went out there and started deleting logs and they tried deleting data from devices around the house. And there's even an instance where Dutch and Razzlecon threw a computing device down a garbage chute when they said it had evidence on it. Now, I wish I knew what of these pictures that was from or where they found this information, but that was it. That was just one mention of the garbage chute computer. And that was, I was like, these people mean business, but hey, hold on. They, they've got more. We've got more. So there's a search warrant at 75 Wall Street, New York, New York. Okay. Seth's from that area. I'm going to explain it for people not from this area. Wall Street is an expensive fucking place to live. Okay. And you see a low number like 75 on wall street immediately i went i gotta see what the inside of this apartment looks like so first well, let's keep you. in mind wall street you know historically has been a place of you know high finance it was only really in the late 80s early 90s where they started converting some of these buildings into mixed use or apartments but it is clearly geared towards people who work on wall street and thus you know you work in 15 18 hours a day they figure why would you want to commute live here so these are by and large like any other new york city apartment but these are especially high-end expensive apartments that you can see are right near the water like literally they're a block off the water there if you can see the picture and as keith yeah. said the lower the number the further down you are towards uh the battery so it's um yeah and we'll show some pictures super fancy yeah so i do i do have a map on the screen i'm sorry audio listeners this is just you can imagine it's right down there at the tip by the water i mean it's the most probably the most prime real estate you could you, you could want especially if you work in finance so immediately i was like i gotta see the inside of this apartment seth and i started you know going to the realtor websites out there and i found their 75 wall street number 35 m listing it looked like it was last purchased about three years ago i have a picture on your screen this is kind of the, the entrance picture when you go to the their apartment on this website called street easy. So I started clicking through the pictures, right? Oh, before I let me stop. I'm sorry, audio listeners. I got to describe some things to you. There's one very important thing on this screen, the price, which is $1.625 million for this condo, which is a one, possibly two bedroom, depending on how, if you want to convert it or not, but it's by anybody's standards outside of new york city it's a small apartment okay and you're spending 1.6 million at and let's see the square foot is probably on here i mean we'll look it up it's probably small but keep in mind you're dealing with a high-end building right the building charges alone common charges are like 1200 
plus monthly taxes. So you're paying two grand just to be in the building, forgetting what, you know, your rent or your mortgage is. Um, so it's a lot. Square footage is 1,040 for the whole That's place. That's fairly large. Oh, for, for New York City. Frankly, I'm surprised it's not over 2 million, to be honest with you. It has, um, it says three rooms, one bed and two baths. So I will pop up a layout on your screen now. So this is the two different versions you can get of it. I don't know which one they had, but the only difference I could see is up on the upper left hand corner is a dining room there. They converted dining room into a bedroom. So you yep. have an extra bedroom. So then I started clicking through the pictures and this is the like living area, which is absolutely fucking fantastic view that i mean i would never leave the, my house if it looked like that you can just see across new york city i mean it, it's a nice high view you can see everything. yeah they're on the 35th and, floor and they have a total view of they probably see the statue of liberty from a certain window um it's just so, all windows yeah it's all oh, windows yeah. and then in their bathroom that's all windows too so you got a tub on one side that's like actual window there and you know walk in shower and stuff and really nice you know marble ish looking counters and stuff on the the right hand side and i was like damn i couldn't imagine taking a bath and actually staring over new york city like that this is their bedroom you know it's pretty much it's almost views everywhere except for a wall kind of in front of them but again you can see across um, new york city and i will tell you that I didn't put a picture in there, but there's an actual deck outside too that you can, I don't know if it's a veranda or what they call them in condos, but it's an outdoor space where you can go out and put chairs and stuff. And it's kind of nice out there as well. So there was a search warrant that happened on January 5th of 2022 at this really swanky apartment. I bet you the neighbors were probably like, holy shit, what's going on here? Cause they're all, you know, very, very expensive apartments. You don't see search warrants probably every day there. So when they got there, Dutch and Razzlecon said, we don't want to be here while you're doing this. And the agents, I imagine trying to be nice, were like, okay, you know, you guys can leave. And they, they said, well, we got to get our cat. You know, we don't want the cat to escape while you're doing the searches, right? So let, let me take the cat with us. And the agent said, all right, go get your cat. Well, apparently Razzlecon went into her bedroom, crouching down next to her bed, calling the cat, but then grabbed one of her cell phones and then was repeatedly trying to hit the lock button, basically make it so that um, an agent couldn't go up there and open up her phone and at least in her mind, see the evidence on it. I know from a computer standpoint, you, they can lock it and you can still easily pull stuff off of it, but she thought she was locking it at the time to probably hide evidence. And it wasn't just her trying to lock it and they get it back. They actually had to wrestle it from her get it out of her hands which i imagine was a scene enough of just this tiny little girl trying to hold onto her phone and a bunch of agents trying to get it away by the way that's totally like i would say resisting arrest and also chargeable as a crime yeah uh so under the bed agents locate a bin and there's various bags in this bin holding multiple cell phones and if you listen to any of our other episodes i think i've ever said like who has multiple cell phones these days but she had multiple cell phones and in there she has multiple sim cards and assorted electronics so i imagine that's like tablets and you know accessories and things now the, get this if this isn't the fucking smoking gun in this whole case i don't know what is the on one of the bags the words burner phone were written so we knew exactly, exactly what that particular phone was used for, Seth. And I have pictures of all this. This is uh, the one that I have on your screen is um, just the bag full of tons of phones that she has. And if I just kind of eyeball this, I would say maybe it's a dozen-ish phones that we can see in the picture. And then if I advance to the next picture, you see the burner phone bag that literally says burner phone handwritten there on the bag and it has some computer stuff inside i love the i love the practicality of like physically writing on by the way this is the burner phone <laughs> yeah anybody else would, go, would just probably think in their mind the yellow phone is the one i need for burner phone and the red phone is my non-burner phone but hey she actually wrote it there were multiple hardware wallets and we've talked about this in a bunch of episodes i can't tell you all the ones off the top of my head because there's at least four or five 
Hardware wallets let you store cryptocurrency on them offline. Trezor is one of those types of wallets. And you're gonna see a picture here in a second of a Trezor wallet. This one that's on your screen is the access token. The next picture that I'm popping up for you are the hardware wallets and stuff. You can barely see it because they photographed a black device on a black background, but kind of under the right lower side of that purse looking thing, there's a black device actually sitting on that table. That's the Trezor wallet because it's black, the screen is black, everything is black on it. It just kind of blends in. Um, and then you see these USB dongles. One says like personal and business. And I imagine she probably had some actual normal non-crime stuff in there too. Now, <laughs> maybe if the burner, if the burner phone was not enough to make you say guilty, there was this book that Dutch decide to hollow out to hide something in it. Now there was nothing hidden in it when they got there and they searched their place, but they did find the book and it was hollow on the inside. So if he would have put something in there, they would have definitely have found it is what I think they're probably showing you there. Now, there was a shit ton of cash. There was at least $40,000 in cash. Um, I'm showing you a picture here. Just It's like a wallet and it looks like brand new bills in there. And it's if it's $40,000, that those have gotta be high, high amount of bills there because it's not a lot of cash for $40,000. They had identification documents so, you know, here's some passport type of looking things. And then they blacked a big chunk of this image out. And I couldn't tell you what's under there. They didn't even allude to it in the court paperwork. Following up on the search warrant, the authorities found other stuff. And this other stuff relates more to clearly Dutch and Razzlecon were, I guess, rainy day thinking, well, if anything went really, really heavy duty, we have to get the fuck out of Dodge. So what did the authorities found? find? They found in the stored cloud accounts several types of incriminating documents. One was a text file that said passport ideas. And on that text file, there were links to uh, different darknet vendor accounts that apparently offered passports or identification cards for sale. They also found vet a file that said vetted vendors that contained a list of darknet vendors offering for sale identification documents, passports, and debit and bank cards. And uh, there's pictures of that corresponding. Uh, they also received, meaning the defendants, a package containing identification information for Russian personas from a darknet vendor. None of this is not sketchy. And I think that was the last picture that I showed you, which is, you know, the passports and stuff. I think that's what they're referring to. So that's yeah. why I put those two together. I don't know for sure, but... I do it's a lot of research and it, it seemed like it went together. Isn't it? So this is, this is the file and I hate, I'm going to show it to you. This is the file that they found. You only can they see about half of it. it. There's so much redaction in here and you can tell there's a tour address because there's a dot onion in there, but it can't tell you, you know, you, you don't know what it is. Everything else is redacted. And then there's this line that says, are you internal passport photo replacement? And it's another tour network dot onion address which is the dark net. Um, and then there's another line that says real Russian passport from Lugansk. Lugansk. Thanks. Must pick up in person forum thread. And then there's a URL that's blacked out. And then there's another one that says DM passport scams, live drops. And there's another URL that's blacked out. And then the last line says EU doc fakes. And again, another URL that is blacked out. So what else did we find here? The cloud storage account also had several folders containing Russian and Ukrainian persona information in the form of passports, identification information, and biographical information for numerous individuals, both male and female. Jones, I do wonder, why do they have so many different, like, repetitive versions of the same stuff? It's like they were really, you know, uh, backing I, up I their processes here. It was the money laundering that they were doing remotely where they hired people and did that whole big scheme where they had mules over there opening things up. I think they probably had all that documentation to support that whole storyline to try to money launder through there. That, that was that was my take when I read it. There was a spreadsheet that detailed the login information and the status of many of the VCE accounts. Um, that's the currency exchange accounts used to launder the stolen funds traced back to the hack. 
that included notations confirming their status as frozen or emptied. The government also corroborated that spreadsheet accurately reflects the account status for accounts for which the relevant uh, crypto currencies did freeze those accounts, those exchanges rather, due to suspicious activity. So it was definitely their stuff related to their hack. Um, and then there were references in the defendant's files, this is both of them, uh, to having some dirty and some clean wallets holding cryptocurrency, including wallets that had files with names that included variations of the word dirty. <laughs> so awesome yeah i showed you the actual spreadsheet to, for our video watchers um again a lot of it's redacted they actually redacted a couple different full columns out of here but um this is actually what showed up in the court paperwork about this is the file that they found and you can see in there it's kind of like a ledger um i i can't remember what episode it was on but seth and i i remember seth you said how does this guy keep something keep his crime straight it's spreadsheets like this. I imagine there's criminals behind the scenes, either on paper or on a computer, making spreadsheets of accounts like this. Because when you have any more than a couple of accounts, you have to keep, you know, usernames, passwords, and all the personal information and all that stuff to keep your crime going. Yep. So, as we talked about earlier, some of the cryptocurrency was converted to gold coins. There were 70 one ounce gold coins purchased using this money. Now, they they basically, they traced it using the receipts and things like that that they found in the apartment. They did not find the 71-ounce gold coins at this point. They looked at um, Dutch and Resilcon's residence, and they also looked at their storage unit. Both of them didn't have it. So that, they're probably going to need a little cooperation to find out where that's at. And that's going to come in Act 4 tomorrow, the plea. So I have to stop here. This is the end of Act 3. Uh, we've just taken you through. Uh, basically, they're caught and all the evidence is on the table. And the last thing we're going to leave you through is what they say happened in their plea. And I hope you come back and watch that. If you liked anything in this act, please like, subscribe, whatever application you're on. If you're on Apple Podcast, a five-star review and just writing in the description box there, whatever episode was your favorite, that helps us out a lot. If you haven't been to our website or if you haven't been there in a while, please do go back to our website. It's ecrimebytes.com and bytes is spelled the computer way. B Y is in yellow milk, T-E-S. And with that, I hope you're on the edge of your chair to see what they say happens in the plea tomorrow with Dutch and Razzlecon. Thanks. Thank you.